Ursa and Chess Homestage Reacts, and this is the insane engineering of the Javelin by the channel Real Engineering. Yes, I don't think I've watched a Javelin video before, so this is going to be interesting. I'm guessing this is one of a kind of weapon, because I've never heard of anything else. Yeah, I know of Javelins from video games, I think, long ago from Call of Duty and shit like that. I knew there was like a weapon that basically tracks and just give it. I don't, I don't think I bought it like, okay, that's real or something. I just thought it was a game thing before I realized, wait a minute, that's real. Because you don't find things like javelin in real world, right? Basically, a launcher that locks into shit and just chase it, which is like insane, right? And that's why javelin is like a really OP thing, even in Ukraine war right now, right? US just gave a lot of javelins to Ukraine and that's it. Most tanks got fucked up. So javelins basically masses up most tanks, right? The tank's biggest fear is javelin, I guess. That's why they create different type of technologies to make sure the javelin doesn't hit the tank itself, but, you know, uh, hit something a few distance away or something. But yeah, <clears throat> uh, I, don't, I don't know how it does it, right? Like, it locks into it, and then basically, like, I'm pretty sure there was also a thing that you can keep track of thing by just keeping the scope there with the javelin. It just will just track where you look or something, right? Is that the thing with javelin too? I don't know. But hey, it's awesome when you see it, right? It launches it, it just launches in the air and then chases it, which is awesome, right? It doesn't require for you to like have that kind of a much of a room or something. You can launch from somewhere, it will just go up and then, you know, come, go after whatever you, you know, was aiming or something. So let's do this one. Remember, we'll flag more and don't subscribe so I know which of you to react to more. I've been doing this military type of videos recently and also from this channel, Real Engineering, obviously, with the uh, tanks and jet planes and things like that. I guess Javelin as well. This is a really good channel for things like that. Uh, I've seen, uh, you know, other videos too from other channels like Task and Purpose, Mustard, uh, Fatrician, things like that. So if you haven't seen those react reactions, check out the link in the description or by the end of the video in the end card. And yeah, uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, I, I think I have Instagram now. Yeah, it's a I don't know, a week or two ago I created only social media that I have, I guess, besides YouTube. Does YouTube count as social media? I don't know. But yeah, that's what this one. At this point, you know what has happened. A tyrant has invaded a peaceful, democratic nation against all logic and morality. An invasion of a sovereign European nation of this magnitude has not been seen since 1939. Mm. The invasion of Poland and World War II at large was dominated by the tank. A technology that shaped the battlefield of World War II. A technology born out of the trenches of World War I. A war defined by artillery and machine guns. The tank served as a weaponized shell to burst through defensive positions. Poland's resistance to this new, battlefield-defining weapon relied on light, infantry-carried anti-tank rifles, towed anti-tank guns, and mechanized anti-tank vehicles. Those anti-tank rifles were attempting to solve one crucial problem a weapon that could be mass manufactured and put into the hands of individual soldiers. A lightweight piece of equipment that could be quickly moved around the battlefield. The tanks the Polish most commonly faced were the German Panzer 1 and 2 and the Soviet T-26, both of which had maximum armor thicknesses between 13 and 20 millimeters. The Polish, in anticipation of this new threat, had developed the Model 35 anti-tank rifle. A lightweight, high-powered rifle capable of penetrating 20 millimeters of armor from 300 meters away. However, a projectile that exhausted its kinetic energy in penetrating the armor, with little left over on the other side, was of little use. Lucky shots to critical engine components located on the rear of the tank may cripple it, but if the Germans or Soviets discovered this rifle had been manufactured in such large numbers, Countering it was as simple as adding slightly more armor to critical areas. Yeah. Poland fell in a single month. Today, yeah, that is we're insane. two months into oh. Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And despite being equipped with modern tanks, with modern reactive armor, they've made little progress. The nature of war... Seriously, man, this is all so fucked up with the... Uh, you know, anybody played Fallout New Vegas would know like how much anti-tank sniper rifle is just awesome, right? It's also part of the, the promo thing. Right, I don't, I don't know which uh, which uh, sniper rifle come close to that one, right? I don't know, but yeah, that was an insane one, right? Every time you hear, what are they called, like, compensator, what are they called, right? In the top of it, right? That looks awesome, but yeah, anti-tank rifles were created to basically, as in anti-material, sorry, it was called anti-material, basically same thing, anti-material, anti-tank, right? 
it's supposed to like disable the tank. I'm guessing the idea is that like it, if you shoot it, like you might shoot the drive or something because if anything is very, if you can pierce through tank, it will be very easy to kill there is anything inside because they're basically trapped there and the sharpener will just basically fly through everywhere. It will cut into pieces type of way, right? So yeah, but the main thing would like he said, you know, killing the engine, things like that. But still it's not the best thing ever, right? Anti-material rifle to use it like that, I don't know. So yeah, obviously they had to like, javelin nowadays is like very easy. Why carry big ass sniper rifle? Like that anti motor rifle when you can carry javelin. Goes on top and suddenly lunges down like, you know, Peregrine Falcon, right? That's what it does. It suddenly like drops like that. <laughs> it's is so insane. Oh, obviously like the, everybody other have made shit like this, but they're like not like more, you know, modu modular, I don't know. Not uh, lighter like that that you can just carry in your hand like that. Look at that, that one guy was just carrying with one hand. So it must be really light. The Javelin began its development in the latter years of the Cold War, designed to fulfill exactly the role the Polish anti-tank rifle sought to fill, a lightweight and mobile anti-tank weapon that would allow individual soldiers to quickly target tanks and escape to cover before being seen. In total, the Javelin system weighs just 22 kilograms, light enough for a single soldier to move around the battlefield. That's enabling good. guerrilla warfare tactics to be pounds, used right? against an About. invading army. The Javelin is so much more than a simple rocket-propelled explosive, like the RPG. The Javelin is a fire-and-forget weapon, capable of guiding itself to the most vulnerable region of a tank from miles away and bypassing even the most advanced reactive armor, allowing soldiers to target, fire and escape to safety. In order to do this, the Javelin employs ingenious bits of technology. To begin, the soldiers need a method of spotting and locking onto a target. This starts with the night vision sight lens, located here. Despite being called the night vision lens, this device provides soldiers with a 4 times and 9 times magnification infrared sight that works an IR one, both not day reason. and night, allowing soldiers to spot enemy tanks from a distance, even in low visibility situations. This lens is part of the Command Launch Unit, or CLU, which attaches to the expendable rocket tubes that contain the round. The fact the tube is detachable makes the CLU by itself an incredibly useful piece of equipment. Yeah, Soldiers really. frequently carried these units on patrols in Afghanistan and Iraq when the threat from enemy armor was low simply because they provided excellent infrared sighting capability. Once connected to a launch tube, the soldier can flip this switch from off to night mode and the cooling unit of the CLU will begin to cool down the infrared detectors to their required temperature, taking two to three minutes. The day mode switch provides sighting capability but cannot activate the seeker. Once the night vision sight is adequately cooled, the soldier has full missile capability. From here, they have several selections to make using the left hand grip. A range of sight options can be selected using the sight selection switch located here. Switching between the wider 4x sight 
or the more narrow 9x sight and between night and day imaging settings. There is also a filter switch which applies a filter to the night vision sight to make enemy detection of the infrared sight more difficult, while the focus setting simply adjusts the focus of the sight. Once a target has been identified, the user can flip a protective cover and press and hold the seeker trigger on the left hand grip, which activates the seeking locking sequence. This also activates the firing trigger on the right hand grip. Over here, the user can select a firing mode with two options, direct and top. All right, but isn't this like, ah, a lot more technical than it needs to be? You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Like, okay, you need a lot of training. And even then, like on the field, right? If you're like, your nerves are not there, right? You're in panic mode. What if you mess up something like this? Like way too many buttons and switches to put, right? Uh, if, if it locks onto itself, shouldn't be this like, okay, just lock. Oh, it locked, just press the button and launch. Rather than having all this like, I don't know. But even if you're going to give all these things, like give that as an additional things, like maybe you could do this, but otherwise just keeping things simplistic is also there. If you don't do all this shit, just like lock onto it, 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 it auto locks, obviously. That's the case, right? It auto locks, right? It locks and then you go, you just press the button, there you go. If you're in a rush and things, all this like you need to do, you can do this, you can do this, you can do it day and night and all that. I don't know, you should be more additional rather than thing you have to do every time which change the trajectories depending on the object being targeted or the surrounding area. The top trajectory is ideal as it targets the least protected section of a tank, but top may not always be possible. The target could be under an overpass or some other obstacle. Mm. This directional pad allows the user to adjust gates manually around the perimeter of the target's profile. This is essentially visually training the seeker on the target. Once locked, the image is saved into the seeker and the user can pull the trigger. From here, things happen extremely quickly. A launch motor fires, pushing the seeker out of the tube with just enough force to get it clear of anyone nearby, about 4.5 meters. This minimizes recoil and makes the system incredibly easy to use, even allowing it to be launched from inside buildings without fear of the backblast turning the building's interior into a pressure cooker. As the seeker leaves the tube, two separate spring-loaded fins deploy. The front set of eight fins, referred to as the wings, provide lift and stabilization to the seeker, while the rear four are controlled by the flight computer to guide the seeker to its target. The mm. control fins are also helped along by four thrust vector control vanes around the nozzle of the rocket motor, which can vector the exhaust of the rocket to provide additional control. At this point, the user's job is done. They can get back behind cover or change position, which is especially useful after giving away their position while firing. The seeker is controlling itself at this point. The image initially locked into the guidance electronics is used to guide the seeker towards its target. But the seeker also has its own infrared imaging camera mounted on its nose. What? The goal of the guidance computer is to keep this image in the center frame using the control fins and thrust vectoring vanes. To do this, it uses pattern recognition algorithms to keep track of the target and updates the target reference image every frame to make the job of tracking the continually changing image as easy as possible. As the Man, that is so insane. I didn't know that the actual rocket itself has a camera on top. Oh, this makes it even more fucking accurate. Man, Javelin feels like one of those technologies that's like, like I've said in the past, like military being one step ahead, right? All the other technology you encounter in your life, you, you think like ja think like Javelin, oh, come on, this can't happen today. Even in, in, even in 2023, you think, like, come on, man, this kind of technology, right? It locks it and also rocket also has a camera. It, it tries to be as accurate as it can. It just works, right? Like, mm. Come on, this is like too, too, too much, right? If somebody came up with technology like this, you'd be like, ah, let, let's see how it works on the field and we'll decide. Javelin is old. This is not a new one, right? And it, it works like this. Like, military always feels like a one or two step ahead in the technology compared to everything else in the world. The seeker closes in on the target. A sequence of events occurs incredibly quickly. The seeker has a two-stage shaped charge. Shaped charges are fascinating. They use fluid dynamics and the kinetic energy of the blast to slice through armor. Shaped charges consist of the charge itself shaped with a hollow indentation where a metal liner is placed. 
When the charge is detonated, a pressure wave forms behind this metal liner, deforming and accelerating the metal into a lance-like jet of ultra-fast metallic particles that cut through armour like butter. Contrary to the shape charge's other name, HEAT, which stands for High Explosive Anti-Tank, this is a purely kinetic mechanism. The shaped charge effectively creates a hypersonic projectile at point-blank range. The metallic liners chosen need to be ductile so that they readily deform and form into a linear jet, maximizing the projectile's penetration ability. A brittle fracture of the liner would result in large chunks of particulated metal that would reduce the penetrating power of the website banana ek jatil karya hai. Hmm. So it just creates this like a small like kinetic uh, fast powered uh thing right so i'm guessing because it explodes in a way i'm guessing it like how you in in space when anything is like anything has a higher kinetic energy higher speed higher kinetic energy than its molecular form uh, that is called you know whenever it collides it's called high speed collision because it doesn't just collide when it collides it explodes at the molecular level because its kinetic energy was much higher than its you know like bind, binding force right so because of the way he explained it, how it becomes like one small streak of like a instant kinetic energy, that might create such a high force that it, it just explodes instantly, right? And creates kind of a huge explosion. That's why inter ballistic missiles, obviously they have nukes and things, but even if they didn't, that missile alone, even the hollow missile, because of the speed itself, would be so devastating, it would be like really powerful. So I'm guessing this is kind of like that. The metal. But this needs to be balanced with the velocity of the jet, which will lower with heavier elements. The javelin itself has two stages. The first stage uses a molybdenum liner, while the main charge uses copper. This two-stage design allows the javelin to deal with modern reactive armor more effectively. Reactive armor are those strange box-like structures you see on modern tanks, and they were created specifically to deal with shaped charges. Mm. Reactive armor works by placing an explosive charge between two metal plates. When a jet from a shaped charge strikes the upper plate, it detonates the inner explosive. You may think this could damage the tank, but the tank's lower armor is more than capable of dealing with the relatively blunt pressure formed by the reactive armor detonation. The outer plate then flies outwards to disrupt the incoming jet, while the shockwave formed by the detonation also breaks up the stream of metal approaching the tank. The first stage of the javelin is designed to trigger these reactive armor boxes before the main charge detonates. Mm. The second charge can then cut through the inner armor unimpeded. Many modern tanks do have secondary defenses to protect against threats like this, like Russia's active protection system, Arena. This system uses radar to detect incoming threats and activates a buckshot-like munition that strikes the incoming threat. This detonates the shaped charge far enough away from the tank that the jet Damn. disperses into too large of an area to effectively pierce the armor. However, the arena active protection system struggles to deal with top-down attacks, something Ooh. the javelin is designed to do. And we are starting to see photos of rudimentary cages placed on top of Russian tanks to defend against top-down attacks. It's important to remember that the footage we are seeing is going to be skewed in favor of Ukraine. This is an ongoing battle where morale is vital. We aren't going to see battles where anti-tank munitions failed. The age of the tank is far from over. It's still a vital tool that has advanced with new modern threats. Mm. However, one thing is for sure. Russia is losing an astronomical number of tanks. Russia's incompetence has been their own worst enemy. Few logistics have left tanks stranded on the roads, air cover against drones has been lacking, and all too frequently we are seeing tanks without adequate infantry and artillery support to deter and defend against these anti-tank munitions. The importance of military tactics cannot be understated. Competent leadership and logistical support makes all the difference. In our ongoing series on Nebula, we explore the exemplary tactics of the RAF during the Battle of Britain. In this month's episode, we explore the doubting system, using our 3D recreation of a Battle of Britain command room to show you. Mm. Yeah, Paul, go to nebula.tv forces real engineering. And yeah, support this channel. <clears throat> Javelin is like, what surprises me that 
Putin basically did this like special operations and sent all these tanks. Didn't he know that West has javelin, which his tanks or any tanks cannot counter because of like a top-down attack, right? Uh, I don't know. This just seems like, you know, obviously he must have known that America is going to send javelins, right? I'm guessing he just assumed that this is just all going to get over in a week before anybody can help. I think that's what he thought. When that didn't work, even he realized, like, oh, fuck. Right, because I don't think he he would know this kind of a thing. Javelin is insane for you know top down attack like this, right? <laughs> yeah, man, I love this. I love insane engineering series. He's he's like a he categorized these things from now. His older video doesn't have that kind of like category name, but now in his newer videos always starts with like if it's something like engineering, the insane engineering thing. I saw the insane engineering video of M1 Abrams and others, and now the javelin. Yeah, javelin is really like insane, right? You know. Uh, the people who created Javelin, are they creating something else like this, right? Because maybe you can make more things out of it. I don't know. But yeah, shape charges thing, right? Shape charges things is made to like penetrate uh, like that, obviously. There are other weapons too that are like shape charge. Javelin has that kind of element. But yeah, the shape charge thing can be so intense, right? Like I said, if it like hits the right place, it can just explode because of, like I said, like high, uh, you know, what did, even I forgot what I said. What is it called? I forgot. High, high speed collision. Yeah, high speed collision. That's what the astro astronomers, yeah, astronomers call astrologists and astronomers. Not astrologists, astronomers and astrophysicists. They, they call high speed collision. High speed collision on Earth would be different, I guess. I don't know what the term is for on the Earth, but anything space related, that's the term they use. When something has more kinetic power than their molecular bond power, I guess. So something like that, yeah. All right, well, if you like my reaction, don't subscribe. If you haven't seen my other reactions to things like this, check out the link in the description and card right now. And yeah, I'll see you next time.